think that the measures themselves are going to have a major impact on the situation. But what they do is they buy time. And, and I think this is what happened last year with the circuit breaker, uh, Minister Gan Kim Yong. Uh, he pointed out that the point of a circuit breaker was to allow you to have some time to try and fix the situation. So there are multiple active clusters. Some of the source patients for the clusters, we don't know where they came from. In particular, the Tan Tok Seng cluster, which is the largest uh, cluster before the Changi Airport cluster. Uh, we have some idea who we think is the most likely uh, source patient or the index patient. Uh, with Changi Airport, we still have no idea. So there's a lot of investigation that needs to be done. There's detailed uh, case control studies. And, and when you sort of shut down or you come close to shutting down the city like the way they've done that, um, it, it's naturally going to slow cross infections. So, you know, when you stay at home, you're not going to spread your infection to another home. Unfortunately, what you're going to do is if you are infected, you're going to spread it to everybody at home. <laughs> and, and that is the lesson we learned from last year's uh, circuit breaker. If your home has got two people or four people, that's not a big deal. But if you've got 100 people living in one block or, you know, in one floor or, or 25 people living in one room, everybody's going to get infected or a very large proportion of them are going to get infected. Uh, and that's what happened with the circuit breaker last year. So, um, so some things are different. Uh, we've got vaccines. Uh, we've learned the lesson about locking down large numbers of people into their own homes. And hopefully, um, you know, we won't have the same kind of problem this year. The, the WHO and the US CDC have got a rather complicated way of classifying the variants. They classify them as variant of high concern, of which none of the variants are currently classified as a variant of high concern. VOC, or variant of concern, of which right now there are three, the B1.1.7, which was first uh, detected in the UK, the B1.351, which was first detected in Brazil, and most recently, the B1.1617, which was first detected in India. Now, Singapore is one of the world's most globally connected cities. In fact, you can find food from anywhere in the world in Singapore. Um, and, and so, you know, it's no surprise that we have all the different kinds of variants. We've got variants that came from South Africa. We've got variants that came from Brazil. We've got variants that came from India. We've got variants that came from the UK. Um, and, and they're there. And, and this is what happens with viruses. Because viruses, uh, when they reproduce, they, they tend to make mistakes. And these make mistakes lead to mutations, which lead to the emergence of variants. And if the variant gives the virus some advantage over other viruses, it will persist and it will spread. So it's no surprise that variants uh, are spread because these are the ones which are, are the most successful in, ter in terms of the virus. I don't know the, the details, but uh, speaking as somebody who reads these reports, uh, I talk to my colleagues in the laboratory, and there's usually two reasons why they don't give you the, the particular strain. Number one is because the amount of virus is low. So if the virus load is low, then there's not enough for you to, to do a detailed investigation and find out um, you know, which strain it is. Um, and two is because uh, it is something which is different. Uh, within the virus itself, it's already starting to throw some changes. So you need to do a more detailed analysis. Uh, I, my understanding is that the majority of the cases which they have not reported is because they haven't finished the analysis or the virus load is too low. The WHO and the US CDC, um, they have analyzed uh, large numbers of studies beginning with the studies from Wuhan in China last year. And, and the average incubation period is still about five to six days. Um, the vast majority of cases who are gonna get infected are gonna get infected within seven to 10 days of their contact with the infectious source. But there is a tail, and there's a handful of cases that are maybe 13, 14, 15, 16 days. The, the hallmark of, of Singapore is being kiasu, I guess. And so, so perhaps that's the reason why they extended the quarantine. The other reason was that they kept detecting uh, PCR positives in a, in a small number of individuals, uh, some of them even months after the infection. And although we believe that these people are not infectious, uh, there's no way of knowing for sure. But sooner or later, they're going to have to do a cost-benefit calculation. And they see how many people you're, you know, you're extending the SHN for um, without, uh, uh, and how much benefit you're getting. Because really, if it's only one in 100 or one in 1,000 people who are going to be infectious beyond day 14, then, then there's a statistic that people use in health economics, which is number needed to treat or number needed to isolate. So if you're isolating 50,000 people just to prevent one person from spreading, you know, that's really uh, a huge cost to society. 
and it's actually a diversion of resources which could be used somewhere else. The PCR test is pretty accurate. I mean, it's currently still the gold standard that's used to diagnose uh, COVID-19. Um, it does miss cases, and, and the cases that it misses tend to be early on in the disease when the virus load is not so high. So, you know, we always tell the junior doctors, if you suspect that the patient has COVID, you know, the person works in Changi Airport, has had a fever, running nose, they will not go away. Uh, just because the first PCR is negative doesn't mean you can release the patient. You know, you should test the PCR patient again a second, third time. And in fact, early on in the outbreak, the doctors from Tan Tok Seng uh, reported a case where first four PCR tests were negative and only the fifth test uh, turned out positive. You, you still need a good uh, clinical judgment. So that's in terms of sensitivity. Now, the next character that we look at is specificity. So if you test PCR positive, does it mean you have the COVID or do, does it, could you have some other virus? And, and PCR tests perform pretty well in terms of this. There are very, very, very few uh, false positives. There are some of them which are due to errors in the laboratory. You know, there have been a few in the last few months in Singapore where, where they made some mistake with the dilution or they've they've run a sample next to another sample which was positive and then there's some spillover. Uh, and so these false positives do occur. And so what the laboratory tend to do is they repeat the test using a different kit and they see if you get the same result. So, uh, and ideally you should not report a positive until you're really 100% sure that it really is a positive. So PCR test gold standard, but they need a sophisticated laboratory. So you need to be able to have access to a laboratory. You need to have a technician who knows what, how to do it. Um, and, and it's costly. All these people who go for PCR tests before events or before travel, they'll tell you you're paying like $160, $170. Now the antigen test is a different story. The antigen test um, is deliberately set up with a lower level of sensitivity, um, but with a very high specificity. So what that means is it's going to miss a, a handful of cases. It's actually going to miss more cases than the PCR. But the cases that it's going to miss are those with a relatively low viral load. So this is the argument that they've used in the UK. It doesn't matter if you miss a handful of people with low viral load who are not really going to spread the virus to anyone. You can still let people go and watch the FA Cup, you know, if they have a negative antigen test, because the chances are that they're not going to have a large amount of virus and they're not going to spread it to a lot of people. The big advantage of the antigen test is it doesn't need a laboratory. It can be done at a stadium. It can be done at a wedding venue. Uh, you know, now with these new restrictions, they're saying that uh, if you want to have more than a certain number of people, you have to do the antigen test. And then the cost is, is much, much cheaper than the PCR test. You know, we're talking about one third uh, to one quarter of the cost. Presenting her as patient zero was premature uh, and it was unfair. Because uh, looking back, if you look at the other Tan Tok Seng patients, it's quite clear there was at least one and maybe two patients who were infected long before she was, who were symptomatic. There's one patient in particular, even though he tested negative the first time around, uh, he tested positive and he had onset of symptoms at least a week before the nurse had her onset of symptoms. So it's most likely that the nurse got the infection from one of the patients. And in fact, the Ministry of Health has released the, the RNA fingerprinting studies, uh, which suggests that the Tantoxane cluster is all the B1.167.2 uh, uh, strain. So it's a unique strain and it's, uh, it's, ident it's identical. The, the cases in the Tantoxane cluster are all identical. So that means there were not multiple introductions. There was somebody at the beginning of the outbreak, maybe in the third or fourth week of April, uh, who was shedding large amounts of virus and, and caused uh, a number of the patients to be infected and a small number of the staff. But every healthcare worker in Singapore, public and private, is being screened right now. That's an unprecedented effort. We hope that it's going to be a one-off effort and that's going to be enough to at least find uh, cases the, the risk of transmission from a healthcare worker in Singapore is very low. You know, we wear PPE as of uh, yesterday. We now have to wear N95 masks, which make life really difficult. I can't breathe. My patients can't understand what I'm saying. So it's really complicated. But, you know, all this is done in the interest of safety to try and make sure that none of us become infected and then we, uh, we, we spread the virus to anyone. We are doing some research into that to try and see whether um, the vaccine is not so effective against this variant. But that doesn't seem to be the case because the variant has been seen in the UK uh, for a few months. And in the UK, as you know, thanks to a very aggressive vaccination program, the numbers have dropped significantly. You know, people always ask me, how come the vaccinated nurse in Tantoxan got infected? 
I told him, do you know that there are about 30 or 40 nurses working in a C-class ward in Singapore? And the fact that only one nurse got infected shows the vaccine is pretty effective. You know, during SARS, when you had an infected patient, you got 15 to 20 nurses who were infected because there was no vaccine for SARS. And in fact, if you look at the patients, two of the patients who were vaccinated who were infected, whereas most of the other patients were crowded together in a C-class ward, like happens a lot of the time in Singapore, uh, the unvaccinated patients had a very high attack rate. I mean, to me, the most logical thing is that this shows that the vaccine does work. You know, if, uh, if you look at the published data or the data from Israel, uh, or even the UK and there are small studies done in California. Uh, the Pfizer-Moderna vaccines work about 95% of the time. 95% means that one in 20 people who are exposed to the vaccine, the, the virus are gonna get sick. Uh, but the, again, the data from other countries shows that even if they do get sick, they don't get severely ill. There's one school of thought which believes that the cleaner got infected because uh, he was breathing in the air that was exhaled by somebody who was uh, who was infected. So the guy went to the toilet or the guy went somewhere near where the cleaner was and started coughing and then the, air, the virus was carried through the air and then the poor cleaner ended up breathing it in, even though he was wearing a, a surgical mask, presumably, because surgical masks do not block out, you know, very small virus particles. The other school of thought, which I belong to, uh, believes that actually the virus can be transmitted through contact and sometimes even through surfaces. So cleaners unfortunately come in contact um, with a lot of very dirty surfaces, uh, and in particular in the toilets. Uh, again, we have been debating for, for one year and we still haven't come up to a conclusive answer. During SARS, there was this MI Gardens outbreak that was believed to be related to aerosol generated from flushing the toilet. And in Singapore, there's a U trap in the toilet. So theoretically, the risk of widespread outbreak like the MI Gardens is very low. But on the other hand, if the guy just went to the toilet and didn't flush, and then the cleaner flushed it, and then the, the didn't cover the toilet, then you know you're going to end up breathing in if the virus is shed in the stool. Uh, a number of studies have found virus in toilets and in stools, and you know some time ago China got into a lot of controversy when they started doing rectal swaps for people. <laughs> you know they're tra trying to screen travelers by doing rectal swaps, and so so we still don't know the answer. But uh, either of those is a likely uh, possibility, either through the air or through contact with a contaminated surface, most likely something contaminated by somebody who's carrying the virus. There are a number of cases of re so-called reinfections. And um, uh, there are a number of individuals who have cancer or who's a weakened immune system who got very sick with the reinfections. But the majority of cases, including the uh, uh, workers at the Westlight uh, dormitory in Singapore, who were shown to have reinfections with a different strain, uh, they had very mild illness. And, and this happens with, um, with a lot of virus illnesses. I know some people have been infected with chickenpox a second time. And you think about it, you know, there were 60,000 people who were infected the first time around with uh, COVID-19 in Singapore. And we've only had a handful. I think the minister said there were like 30 or 40 people who were reinfected. So, so we're talking about less than 1%, you know, probably uh, who got actually a, a reinfection. And, and many of those, we don't know whether they're really a reinfection or they're just uh, shedding virus. Um, and I'll tell you, I have the most interesting individual. This is a woman who had TB uh, uh, four times. She went to the TB control unit and they watched her take her pills every day for, for nine months. And she still managed to get a relapse of her TB. And it turned out that her mother had TB and her father died from TB. So there's some genetic reason why certain individuals are prone to certain infections. And based on the clinical trial data, there is, as I said, about a 5% failure rate for the, for the vaccine. But those 5% tended to have mild disease. And um, mild disease, that means they didn't need hospitalization, they didn't need ICU care, and there were fewer deaths. This has got huge implications for the strategy moving forward. Because uh, one of my colleagues wrote about this in Today. And he said, you know, are we going to have to start thinking about living with the virus? If we vaccinate um, a significant portion of the, pub, uh, the population, and, and you know, you've heard things like 70%. I would think that for Singapore, it's probably gonna be about 80 or 90% because we are so globally connected. We're so dependent on foreign workers coming in. So, you know, unless the whole world is 70%, 70% is probably not enough for us. See, we probably need to be a bit higher than that. So if a significant proportion of the population is uh, immunized, then you're not gonna get severe disease. So this should be the goal, see, zero deaths, zero severe infections, rather than zero COVID. Because you know, if you go for zero COVID like Australia and New Zealand, 
you know, you're going to have to tighten the borders. Australia, they get one case, they lock down the city for three days. You know, it's very, very hard to sustain that. And, and with a globally connected city like Singapore, I, uh, I was vaccinated very early in January. Uh, and I'll be honest, um, you know, I, I've said this before. Uh, an mRNA vaccine would not be my first choice of vaccine because it's a new and untried technology. And I said that, you know, if one of the companies that makes um, the seasonal flu vaccine, if they made a, a, a conventional vaccine, I would take it in an instant. I would, I would run out and join the queue. But for some reason, those companies uh, are not making the conventional vaccine. The conventional vaccine, which is the vaccine that's made by Sinovac, Sinopharm and Bharat Biotech, uh, China and India, basically, is you grow the virus in a, in a laboratory and then you kill the virus and then you inject it into the person and the person mounts an immune response against the killed virus. Uh, and that's a technology which is 100 years old. It's been proven successfully to work for, for so many viral infections. It's, uh, uh, it's highly effective. So the reason why uh, you know, uh, me and a lot of other people took the vaccine is because we want to travel. <laughs> and we know that sooner or later, you know, um, they're going to make, make it a requirement. So I think um, I would tell people, look, you know, people love to travel. We've had a year and a half where we've had no chance of traveling. You know, if you want to travel you know, and you want to get on one of the first flights, you better get yourself vaccinated. When the, the outbreak first occurred in, uh, in Wuhan, the only country that, the, the country that reacted really, really fast in terms of closing the borders to tourists from, uh, from mainland China was actually Taiwan. They sent their own people to Wuhan to try and find out what was going on. You know, Singapore reacted by banning travel from uh, UK and Brazil. And then what happened was uh, people would come through a third country. You know, they would go and spend two weeks in Dubai and then they would come <laughs> into Singapore. Um, and unfortunately, banning travel, I think, is going to be reactive most of the time. What it does is if you're starting to have a very difficult to control problem, then you ban travel. And then what you're doing is you, again, buy yourself some time to, to track down all those who have traveled to quarantine, to isolate, to test, and do all those things. Australia um, banned travel from India. And then what they did was they organized these evacuation flights for Australian citizens who were in India. Singapore did uh, organize evacuation flights to Wuhan um, at the beginning of the pandemic. So it just requires um, a lot more thought, you know, because there, there's travel bans, I mean, Many people have not seen uh, family members, even Malaysians. In fact, the WHO does not recommend any travel bans, but nobody listens to them. And I think, you know, what we needed to do was actually to be more aware of what's going on uh, around us and, and to put more resources. We have some really very good molecular biologists, but they really need the resources. And, and again, the UK, uh, paradoxically, is a, is a leader in this. Um, <clears throat> and they started a few years ago uh, testing every single strain of TB. They did uh, uh, fingerprinting for every single strain of TB. And the uh, molecular biologists in Singapore tried to do that and it took years, but we finally have, have started doing that. And that's how we found the Bedok uh, betting shop TB cluster. It's just through the genetic analysis of all the TB strains. So we are uh, pretty good in terms of the number of strains, but if we had you know, a lot more resources uh, I think we could do it uh, a lot better. And, and in fact, what we need to do is we need to not just test every strain in Singapore, but we need to have collaborations with our regional neighbors so that we can test every strain and, because most of them have, don't have the capacity you know, to, to do this kind of molecular biology testing. So uh, we do that uh, so that it benefits us in a way. It helps them, it builds their capacity so that they know what's going on in their country. But because we are going to be, for the near future, at least uh, a super open society, then we know what's going on before it comes to Singapore. You know, like uh, SAF, right? The philosophy is always, uh, you don't fight on your own ground, you see, because you, uh, by that time, it's too late. So you have to know what's going on around you. You have to have a situational awareness of, uh, of the surroundings. I mean, I think, again, I, I don't want to talk about hindsight and what would have done in the past, but I can tell you moving forward, what I would do is, uh, is at, at one week, see, so we put in all these measures. At one week, these have to be critically evaluated, one to two weeks, see, because the incubation period, if you say it's about five to eight days, then about two weeks is, is coming out to the end of one full incubation period and the majority of cases. And then you see whether these things work. And then, you know, what I would like to do is to have the data made widely available. 
see the they do come up with press releases every day and there's a lot of information in there but you know what the uk's public health england does is they, they make huge amounts of data uh, available so that scientists and even amateur scientists can can try and do their own calculations and work out um, you know what's the percentage of hospitalization for this area and what's the percentage of transmission uh, and uh, you know the the uk government has not had a great track record this pandemic but the vaccination seems to have worked and by releasing a lot of the data they've taken the edge off some of the criticism so that you get, you know, you get different groups, people who like them, people who don't like them, can can all look at the same data, and they can fight it out uh, sort of scientifically. MOH used to publish the the Sentinel surveillance data, right? They used to tell you the number of individuals who were swabbed. Now they just tell you the total number of swabs that were done. The dashboard, I think, needs to to have a lot more granularity. It needs to have a lot more detail, and, and there needs to be a critical evaluation. And we need to be frank with Singaporeans about what the choices are. See, do we go the zero COVID approach? And what is the cost going to be of going for a zero COVID approach versus the living with the virus? And, uh, and also, you know, to try and accelerate, uh, and, and they are doing this to a certain extent, you see, trying to accelerate the vaccination program, but there are certain constraints in terms of access to vaccines. And, and this is where, again, we need to really take a stand with uh, the countries that do not manufacture vaccine. There's a campaign at the WTO, it's led by the governments of South Africa and India, where they are trying to suspend the vaccine patent. Uh, and I think that's going to work because India has a capacity to manufacture more than enough vaccines for the world. Uh, in Africa, there's a lot of vaccine manufacturing capacity too, and it's used largely for agricultural vaccines. So I think that um, if they can persuade the WTO to suspend the patent during this pandemic, then the amount of vaccines produced will be uh, will be enormous and uh, and it will be open for if anybody can produce it uh, with quality control maintained the, the epidemic can be brought under control i i mm. when the pandemic first started i hoped everything would end in the summer <laughs> the first summer yeah. and uh, and the numbers went down but unfortunately we had this huge explosion in september october last year and so so i was proven wrong on that um, and unfortunately, you know, right now with vaccines, there's a chance that the pandemic can, can be brought under control. But the vaccine rollout has been painfully slow in many of the big countries, in India, in China, in, uh, in large parts of uh, even in Eastern Europe, in Russia. Because Singapore is such an open society, uh, as they say, you know, nobody is safe until everybody is safe. Uh, and that is explicitly true of Singapore. But I think a lot of it depends on WTO. Because if the WTO grants this uh, uh, waiver, then I think uh, the countries are just waiting to, to ramp up. You know, Indonesia has large vaccine manufacturing capacity. Uh, they make their own bird flu vaccine for, for the uh, animals. So, so it's, and some of these vaccines are actually not difficult to make, but it's the patent protection which makes them very expensive. SDP is not against uh, foreigners coming into Singapore. See, we, but we think that it needs to be calibrated we have this uh, talent track system, which is similar to the Australian system, where we believe in a point system, where if you have close family relationships, if you have a skill that Singapore needs, then you get a certain number of points, and then you get a chance to come into Singapore, because we want to be open to people, you know, we're not going to be like North Korea and shut the, shut the borders to everyone. But at the same time, you see, we do not want to exploit the foreigners, you bring in foreigners, you pay them really, really low wages. You make them pay a huge uh, levy to the government. And, and all that does is it drives down the wages. So the jobs are not attractive to Singaporeans. I mean, I can tell you this, you know, um, there, there are many Singaporeans who would do many of these jobs if they were paid a decent wage. Uh, I, I was really surprised. Um, you know, I've been in uh, Australia and New Zealand and you find uh, Singaporeans working at uh, blue collar jobs over there. And I say, why in the world are you doing uh, this, I mean, Singapore, people wouldn't even think about it. He said, you know, here, I'm getting paid five times the amount of what I was getting paid in Singapore. I can, my annual vacation, I can drive a car, I live in a house with a garden. You know, so, so I think it's not that Singaporeans don't want to do these jobs. It's just that the, the conditions have been made so onerous. And, and that's been facilitated by a policy which allows migrant workers to come in and, and it un underpays them. Because if we had a minimum wage that was the same for Singaporeans as for migrant workers, then there's no incentive for uh, a company to hire a migrant worker if you pay the Singaporean the same. Of course, there's the issue of national service. 
But again, for national service to really make a difference, uh, if it's really truly national service, then uh, MINDEF should make it worthwhile for the employer and the employee. So that, that is a real contribution, you know, not some sort of uh, ceremony or whatnot, but really making sure that there's a level playing field so that the Singaporean can compete with the migrant worker, uh, get a decent job, get a decent living for his family, and, and, and you know, not do this uh, kind of race to the bottom. See, things like construction, like manufacturing, we have no choice. We have to be on site. You know, a lot of the senior executives, especially in the services industry, there's no reason why they, they need to go to the office. This is actually going to change the whole nature of work, I think, for a lot of people. Uh, there's good and bad points. A uh, good point is flexibility. You know, you don't have to fight traffic. You, you can wake up at 7.45 for an 8 o'clock meeting. Um, the bad points is that sometimes you're always working, you know, and then uh, so the boss feels that he doesn't see you, but he can still send you a task to do. And, and frankly, uh, very, very few viral infections actually need a third booster. The exception is the flu, where you need to get vaccinated every year. And that's because the virus mutates. Recently, I've had a couple of patients uh, who had the MMR vaccine, and then they were tested, and then they were found to have low levels of antibody. Recommendation is you give them one booster dose, and then you don't test them again. Uh, because again, every vaccine is about 90, 95, most of the commercially available vaccines, 90, 95%. So what that means is five to 10% of people are not going to have a, have a good response. So I don't think there's gonna be a need to boost everybody, but there are some people, maybe those at high risk, you see those who are going to be working in Changi Airport or the harbor, then you know, we want to make sure, and now we can actually measure the, the antibody level so we can see how protected they are from the virus. This has actually been the case with a number of the Tantoxin cluster. The first test is negative. Uh, then the second test a few days later is positive. By the time they're symptomatic, uh, usually by the second or third day, they're positive. As I mentioned earlier, the PCR is not 100% sensitive. And um, it depends on your clinical judgment. So if the patient is still having symptoms, if the fever won't go away, then you should certainly do a second or third test. And as I mentioned, there's a publication from Tantok Seng, NCID, where they showed you needed to test somebody four or five times before you found out that they actually did have uh, COVID. You'll notice that now the community cases are more than the imported cases. So, so they have put in very strict uh, regulations, you know, um, and this is for every country except for a tiny handful, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Brunei. So we have colleagues from the US who are here on an employment pass uh, and they dare not go back to the US because they think they won't be able to come back to Singapore. So, you know, all their summer vacation plans with their family, even though in the US they've opened, opened up, but those who are in Singapore are staying here. See, they're not willing to, to run the risk of, uh, of going there and not being allowed back into Singapore. So, so there are some measures which have been put in for imported cases. Don't know whether they're too late, but they're certainly in place already. So, so I don't think there's very much else they can do short of completely you know, shutting the borders and arranging for evacuation flights for Singaporeans and PRs. You know, I just read a report, there's a prison chef who turned positive. We had a case last year when there was somebody in the prison who was positive, but this was somebody who was uh, uh, kept in a single cell. So I think prisons uh, are a major area. You know, people in Singapore don't think about the prisons. Prisoners are invisible. You know, you have this yellow ribbon project and then once in a while you think about them, but the rest of the time, you know, it's, it's so much stigma. But across the world, in Thailand, you know, the big outbreak right now is occurring in the prisons. So I would say the prisons are a major uh, potential blind spot that uh, we have to be really, really careful about. I'm not a fan. You know, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, there are two schools of thought in the medical and scientific, uh, the close contact versus the uh, airborne, and I'm more on the close contact side. But on the other hand, the air purifier can reduce, re I, I have a very sensitive nose. And so the air purifier removes a lot of the dust particles. So maybe, you know, it reduces people from sniffing and uh, sneezing. So if the guy has um, a mild COVID and you prevent him from sneezing, you're preventing him from spreading the virus all over the place. Mm. You're just specifically killing the virus. Uh, I, I think, you know, just uh, probably a, a small benefit, but not a huge amount. This is a very controversial thing. And this came up during the WHO visit to China to study the origins of the virus. Because the PRC government is trying to argue that this virus came from outside uh, on frozen food and went into China. Now there's no evidence that uh, the virus can spread from frozen food and infect people. 
they can find the virus on frozen food. In fact, there was a study that was subsequently retracted from Singapore where they showed that you could culture the virus on frozen food for a very long time. But, uh, and virus has been found on frozen and meat packing plants in the US. But whether it's from infected person infecting the food or the food infecting the person, uh, it tends to be more person spreading virus, you know, shedding virus onto the food. Uh, and whether the, the virus can go on to infect somebody from frozen food is, is still not proven. It's not impossible, but I would say it's relatively unlikely because, you know, the vast, like for example, in Singapore, the, the dorm outbreaks, you know, the vast majority of them don't handle frozen food, but they got infected because somebody in their room was infected. Like I said, you know, if, if Sinovac was the vaccine, the kill vaccine was made by any other company which has a track record of exporting vaccine, I would be the first in line for it. But the trouble is that the regulatory procedures, um, um, you know, Sinovac has, has tried to get Singapore regulatory approval for a very long time and it still uh, has not been approved by HSA. So, uh, so that is a concern because HSA is quite stringent. They follow uh, international standards and, and they require primary data which they review. So I wish that um, Sinovac would have that data because there seems to be real world evidence from like Indonesia where they've used Sinovac and it seems to be relatively effective in, uh, in what they have done. But again, we haven't seen published data in the peer reviewed literature and uh, we haven't seen data that satisfied uh, HSA. So that's a, that's a pity. I know many older people, you know, like I said, people get vaccinated for travel and China says they only accept Sinovac or Sinopharm. So they are waiting for Sinovac to get approved, but it's taking a really long time. My understanding from the last HSA statement is the, they are asking Sinovac for data and Sinovac hasn't provided them the data. So, so the data is from that, uh, that end. We haven't heard the details about the, which variant is involved with the Changi Airport cluster, except for the press release uh, about three or four days ago, where they said that they had identified the B16172 variant as the cause of the Tantok Seng cluster and a different variant, but a subset of 1617. So presumably either 16171 or 16173 as the cause of the Changi Airport cluster. So it is probably one of the variants, but a subset of one of the variants. Now, when it comes to a finger peer, my understanding is like, you know, when you go and collect your bags, the, all those uh, from a certain number of gates, they will end up at the same uh, conveyor belt. Um, and, and it's quite self-contained because uh, they go through the, there's the same sort of toilet area, there's the same sort of screening area. So there's like four or five belts that are, that are together. So I don't think it's possible to pinpoint one particular, you know, uh, place of origin for, for that belt, given the fact that Changi Airport, there's such a few flights coming in all together. Um, but we still don't know, you see, whether there was a single super spreader, somebody who was highly infectious and then spread the whole, the, and then infected the whole of the Changi Airport cluster, or whether it was multiple introductions. But we will know the answer once the genetic data is, is processed. Because there's a difference. See, if it's one person who brought it in, and then, you know, unfortunately, like SARS, there was that one woman who brought it in, and all the subsequent strains were related to her uh, virus. So if there was one person on one flight who was a so called part of a super spreading event, then, um, then we will know because all the Changi Airport cases will be very, very close to each other. It'll be like the hepatitis C, where all of the cases of hepatitis C and SGH were, were almost identical. There was only one or two mutation differences which is very different from other hepatitis C outbreaks where you get multiple different strains involved. Right now, there are a few things. One, Sinovac is not licensed in Singapore. Two, uh, the vaccines are free, so they're not gonna pay for a third jab. So you probably have to wait until it becomes commercially available. And that would be uh, like a booster, you know, that you, in fact, one of my patients, um, he received two doses of AstraZeneca overseas. But too bad he, it was too late because he got exposed to the virus and then he came down with it. So he said, should I get a third dose of Pfizer? So I said to him, let's just uh, wait for you to recover. We'll do some uh, blood tests. We'll see your antibody levels. And then we can have a discussion. As, and, and of course, we have to appeal to MOH because MOH currently controls the stocks of uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. They haven't made it available for private sector or GPs just yet. Theoretically, there's no good reason why it shouldn't work. And in fact, there are studies being done in the UK where they're doing this mix and match of uh, AstraZeneca and Pfizer and trying to see whether they, they work. See, are we going to continue with this uh, aim of going to zero COVID 
or are we going to be prepared to accept uh, a few mild cases here and there? There's, of course, a few considerations. In order to, to do the living with the virus strategy, we must have enough vaccine to be available. So I think what the public needs to do is they need to have honest discussions. We need to try and get some data from the government you know, as to how much vaccine is really available. Is it true that if everybody wants it under the age of 45, they're going to be able to get it? This is a mindset change, you see. Are we, are we prepared to accept a small number of mild cases in exchange for being allowed to open up the economy, going to a restaurant, going to a hawker centre and all that? And, and I'd like to encourage your readers, your writers to, to start thinking about this. See, like I said, my colleague, uh, Dr. Su, in his piece in the, today, two days ago, he sort of highlighted this issue of living with the virus. Uh, and we have to start thinking about it, see. We still don't want to have deaths, we don't want to have severe cases, but whether we can tolerate a few mild cases. I think that's a conversation we have to have. And I think, you know, a lot of countries are talking about this as an opportunity to rethink the whole nature of work, the whole nature of business. But for Singapore, the most obvious thing to me is this over-dependence on, um, on, on foreign workers. And it's not good for anyone. You know, it's not good for the foreign worker. They come here, they get exploited, they get treated very badly. Uh, on the, the assumption they're just going to come here for three, four years, make some money and go back. Uh, and it's definitely not good for the locals because it depresses wages. This has been shown all around. Um, and so I think, you know, that is a serious issue, which uh, the whole nature of our economy and not just the construction, marine and processing sectors uh, needs to be examined. Uh, Walter Tessira talked about this, uh, caregiving. See, because it's so easy to outsource caregiving to foreign domestic workers. Home nursing segment has been priced out of range of most average middle-class Singaporeans. That needs to change. And that can change very quickly with uh, appropriate government intervention, with subsidies tar that are targeted. Um, and I think if we don't, uh, when the next pandemic comes, we're going to be back to square one or even square minus one.